In Cable Number 1, Jerry Duggan and Phil Noto reunite for only the second character solo arc ongoing in Marvel's Krakoa era of X-Men with the wildly controversial Teen Cable. It's a fantastic, unexpected first issue to discuss. Today I'll answer, who is Cable and what's his history? Will we survive Teen Cable? And how is Cable setting the stage for the Ten of Swords X-Men crossover coming this summer? I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. If you like Comic Book Herald YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Links to CBH channels and Patreon support are included in the show notes. You can find full X-Men and comic book reading orders on ComicBookHerald.com, as well as all Kraken Krakoa analysis as I dig into everything X-Men. Spoilers for discussed comics may follow. Cable number one opens with a day in the life of Teen Cable, beginning with Nate and Wolverine facing off in the Krakoa arena known as the Quarry just for kicks. It's a nice intro displaying Teen Cable's lust for life, his familial relationship with Uncle Wolvie, and perhaps most importantly Phil Noto's incredible interior art, which is some of my favorite in all of the Dawn of X to date. Just look at that glowing red interpretation of Silver Samurai. We've seen two versions of Cable so far in the Dawn of X, one in Fallen Angels and one in X-Men. In Fallen Angels, we get sad boy teen Nate Summers running missions with Psylocke just to feel something, listening to a lot of sunny day real estate and possibly developing, developing a romance with Laura Kinney that I'm actually pretty curious if we'll ever see again. Given Fallen Angels already completely ignored status in the Dawn of X, this can more or less be completely ignored, but you and I both know that it happened. Meanwhile, in the Hickman written and Lionel Francis U penciled X-Men number two, we get Meatball Cable, making bonehead decisions about live grenades and jokes to himself about time travel. Admittedly, I prefer this version by approximately 12 million percent, because one, it's just a lot more fun to read, and two, Team Cable should behave differently than grizzled war veteran Cable. It makes sense. Fortunately, Jerry Duggan is taking all of his inspiration from this interpretation as well. Which brings us to today's first issue. For his part, Duggan and Noto quickly send Cable on a monster hunt to Arako, where little toddler mutant fauna has gone missing. It's both a fun adventure that ties back to Cable's trip with Papa Summers and Sister Rachel in X-Men number 2, and builds towards insanely exciting developments that connect to everything from the upcoming Ten of Swords crossover to the entire Marvel cosmic landscape. But before we get into all of that action, let's take a moment to level set. Who is Cable? For the most part, Cable is known as a militaristic survivor from a future timeline ruled by Apocalypse, all enormous guns, telepathic powers, and metal robot arm. He's a time traveler and present-day X-Men player with roles across New Mutants, founding the original X-Force, and joining everyone from the X-Men to the Uncanny Avengers, which is actually a series Duggan wrote him in post-Secret Wars. If you know anything about Nathan Summers, it's that he's a timey-wimey embodiment of 90s Marvel with a grim outlook and plays a great straight man, sometimes to Deadpool. Of course, as his last name implies, Nate is a Summers, the son of Scott Summers and, well, technically Madeline Pryor, and his childhood is really messed up. During 1991's X-Factor number 68, Apocalypse infects baby Nathan with a techno-organic virus, and in order to save his life and defeat Apocalypse, Gene and Scott have to agree to let Sister Ascani take baby Nathan into the distant future where the virus can be kept at bay. Both Apocalypse and Mr. Sinister have taken a deeply invested interest in baby Nathan, with Sinister, of course, obsessing over the potential of the Summers and Grey, well, prior bloodline. Indeed, as Sinister is all too happy to remind Cable, he is more or less responsible for Nathan's existence, since Sinister's schemes and machinations are so heavily integrated into the lives of Scott Summers and, of course, Madeline Pryor. Once he's back from the future, Cable quickly takes to leading teams like the New Mutants and, more famously, X-Force. Cable's bounced around in the time string since then between stints with the X-Men and the aforementioned teams that I mentioned, including the Uncanny Avengers. Most essentially, for my money, his role uh, protecting and carrying Hope Summers as the mutant messiahs throughout the, the post-messiah complex era of X-Men, which kind of runs from about 2007 to 2012. There's a really good 2008 to 2010 uh, Dwayne Swarzynski written run in there just called Cable, which is all about Cable and Hope fleeing through the time stream, trying to protect this mutant messiah. It's a good read if you're invested in that era of X-Men. In the pre-House of X stage of mutant kind, though, in the extermination event, familiar Cable, old man Cable, is assassinated by Teenage Cable, who blames the OG for letting Hank McCoy pull the original Teen X-Men from their past to present-day Marvel, wreaking all kinds of damage on the time stream. 
apparently he couldn't just take this out on Brian Michael Bendis for performing this operation in all new X-Men. And of course, old G Cable still did not prevent Teen Cable's hellish future. Teen Cable views his actions a necessary correction for an old Cable that wasn't fulfilling his duty of protecting the time stream. Does any of this make sense? I have no idea. Nonetheless, we are good and stuck with Teen Cable, and we had best embrace that. Back in Cable number one, in the course of defending Little Fauna from the Araco monster with aid from Pixie and Armor, Cable uncovers a giant sword in the beast's foot, setting it off and causing its rage in the first place. With the upcoming Summer X crossover titled Ten of Swords, this is clearly a capital big deal. And apart from some choicely worded Betsy Braddock dialogue in Excalibur last week, the first very clear setup that I've seen for the event. Even cooler, this isn't just any sword, but as Cable's psychic flashback tells him, it's the former sword of a Galadorian space knight known as Morn. The sword is known as the Light of Galador and was apparently lost when Morn arrived on Araco and found himself blindsided by demonic prey, presumably this giant monster which maybe stepped on him and crushed him and got his sword stuck in its foot, which maybe it's had there for millennia. That seems like a really bad foot problem. This connection instantly gives Cable unexpected ties to the Marvel cosmic landscape and appropriately for the character ties back into the Marvel Universe's past, as the sword has possibly been lost since what Morn described as Primordial Earth. The discovery of the Light of Galador wakes up Space Knight armor on display in the Bakgigian Museum of Lost Civilizations, which is a damn fine idea, and I would love to see more of this, meaning we are now destined for a Cable vs. Space Knights showdown. While I won't get too in the weeds on this, the most famous Galadorian is Rom the Space Knight, who due to toy licensing issues is now published by IDW, although Rom was a part of the Marvel Universe from 1979 to 1986 and is one of my most uh, esteemed comic book collections sitting in the long boxes behind me. The Space Knights remain a part of Marvel, though, and can be found semi-recently in the likes of Annihilation, Conquest, and Annihilators, as part of the Dan Abnett, Andy Lanning, Marvel Cosmic Universe, which is a highly recommended read. The final big reveal in Cable number one is that Old Man Cable is going to be a part of the series, so if you need substantially more grizzle in your cereal, Cable will deliver. Old Man Nate is seen busting monsters in a hellish landscape and details in a data page diary the possible development of a new demonic inferno on Earth, which of course we've seen te teased since way back in Powers of Ten and Sinister Secrets. Rapid Fire Predictions. This issue confirms Cable is one of the ten core mutants with swords in Ten of Swords. It also has me doubling down on my initial theory that Ten of Swords will be heavily focused on Apocalypse saving his first horseman from Araco. I'm willing to bet cold hard cash. Old Man Cable is trapped in the realm of Limbo, hence those Inferno connotations. And finally, Cable's going to rock Space Knight armor in Ten of Swords at some point, and it's going to be glorious. Outstanding questions. Moira's afraid of precogs. What about time travelers? How does that work on Krakoa? Is Strife welcome? on Krakoa, and what would that mean for Teen Cable? And finally, what's this Cable's reaction to Apocalypse and his status on Krakoa? He spent his whole life fighting an Apocalypse regime. How is he reacting? Seems quite positively by the smile on his face when he found this sword, but I would like to see that developed in this series a little bit more as well. What did you think of Cable number one? I'd love to hear your comments here on the YouTube channel or over on comicbookherald.com. You can find me anywhere online at comicbookherald. And of course, I enjoy talking comics, theories, and X-Men with you wherever you may find me. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And as always, enjoy the comics.